Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. A warm welcome uh, for this first talk at this uh, fascinating festival here. Great to see you all on a wonderful Saturday morning in Vienna. My name is Raymond Löw, and I have the honor to guide you through uh, today's discussion. Revolution, I understand, is the overall uh, theme of this festival. If I look at the title of this talk, Marx in the Age of Trump, I guess we'll also have to discuss a little bit about counter-revolution. Uh, it's a particular pleasure for me to welcome Professor Postone here in the Wien Museum. Professor Postone is mm -hmm. Professor of History at the University of Chicago, where his focus is social theory. Uh, in this academic year, Professor Postone has a little uh, project in Vienna, namely to rewrite Das Kapital. <laughs> and uh, he, he is a fellow at the Institute of Human Sciences in Vienna, uh, and they uh, seem to be into big projects too. Uh, uh, you can watch many of his talks and, and his contributions on YouTube that will give you uh, an idea of the broad array of interest uh, and, and out of research Moshe Postone uh, has been linked to. It's uh, born in Edmonton, I just learned, in Canada, but did his uh, academic uh, education in Frankfurt we, and, Chicago. and Chicago, and in Frankfurt working with Iring Fetcher, who is, uh, might be known by many of us who, uh, as a person who has introduced us to Marxism, uh, with his writings. His main work was published in 93, Time, Labor, and Social Domination. It has been translated in many different languages and he's trying to put Marx on a different footing. Well, we'll hear about that um, during this talk. Um, he was also inspired by not only thinkers uh, and, and scholars from the Frankfurter Schule, but also by a creative economist, um, Roman Rostolsky, who is uh, credited as the one who discovered the Grundrisse. So, uh, the, uh, so those of us who uh, were uh, reading Marxist economics uh, at a certain moment gave up on the, uh, the Kapital Volume 2, then we went back to the Grundrisse, so that was thanks to Roman uh, Rostolsky, but we're looking forward to the new version of this capital here. Um, Professor Postone has been researching a, a broad scope of, of, of um, European intellectual history in this framework, also focusing on anti Semitism and its role in the catastrophe of the 20th century. Well, uh, Professor Postone, Marx in the age of Trump, let's maybe start in a general uh, way with a general uh, question, what's, how do you see the development of the intellectual climate in American universities? We know, okay, there are very conservative universities, there are less conservative universities. Is it possible to say, to give a, a general trend uh, in mainstream universities, in research, as well as among students uh, in the age of Trump? Let's see, does this work? Yes. Um, well, it depends on which universities and which fields. There are fields, the positivist social sciences, that I think are just continuing as if nothing has changed. But in the humanistic social sciences and in the humanities, I think really since 2008, there's been a turn away from what had been very dominant for a while, which was cultural studies, what was called the linguistic turn, the cultural turn, that there's a turn away from it because all questions of economy were completely neglected. And suddenly, with the crisis of 2008, it became evident that uh, this was a mistake. And what's happened in many of the major, the, let me just say, if people know this or not, the American university system is extremely hierarchical. There's really a hierarchy of universities. It's not like in Europe where universities are considered to be more or less 
on the same level where some areas might be stronger, others weaker. In the United States, you have, let's say, the top 10 universities, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Chicago, Berkeley, you know, a few other, Columbia, and then you go down, and then you go down. And it's really at these top universities that there has been a turn to a great deal of discussion on capitalism and much more interest in Marxian critical theory. How did that evolve, the, the interest in Marx, in these uh, uh, Ivy League uh, universities? They are so, sort of trendsetters, I, I would guess, in the academic life in, in, in the US. Well, it evolved through a consideration of capitalism. It really started much more with people thinking about, I mean, for decades, you couldn't even use the word capitalism in American universities. You talked about the free market system or something like that, but you, it was considered to be not exactly respectable to use the word capitalism, that's changed a lot. And interestingly enough, it changed in two areas. One, which is one that I'm more concerned with, which is contemporary social and economic changes, the age of Trump. And the other, there's a lot of work being done at Harvard, Chicago, on capitalism and slavery. So it has to do, this is an American problematic and it has to do with rethinking the relationship of slavery and capitalism. What kind of uh, questions, what kind of uh, approaches do people have where they think that Marx is helpful for them to give answers to? I think a lot of people have, re when they think of Marx, other than, I mean, you still have traditional Marxist groups that exist in every university, they're quite small. Uh, but not, I think the effect of, there was a strong reception of the Frankfurter Schule, of people like Georg Lukacs, and I think there is a rereading of Marx through that lens. Certainly, I would include myself there. You mentioned the political currents, Marxist currents. Uh, maybe if you go a little bit back uh, in, into uh, American uh, intellectual life after World War II, I mean, there was a certain influence by the Communist Party among thinkers. There was Trotskyism, in, not as a real political force, neither of both, but as an element of, of, of political discourse. Is anything left of these traditions? Very little. Uh, there are groups uh, that maintain this tradition. Uh, certain kinds of Trotskyist groups like the Spartacus League uh, that maintain, but they have very little. Basically, first of all, the communists, as you very well know, were, were crushed by the, by the American state. But also, I think the movement of the 60s really left that kind of Marxism, I think this happened in many places, left that kind of Marxism behind because it didn't seem to address the kinds of issues that were motivating people. So it wasn't a turn against these Marxist groups, it was much more a movement away from them. I mean, you had, even in the Democratic Party, you had a social democratic current. Uh, yes. Uh, Harrington, wh whose book on, on the inequalities in the US was very uh, influential. Um, today, you on, don't only have Trump and, and, and the Tea Party, you also have uh, Occupy Wall Street, the Occupy Wall Street movement, and you have the po political current represented by Bernie Sanders. Is there anything that links these uh, um, questions about capitalism and, and, and search for Marxist answers to these political currents? Uh, I now have to take distance from myself in order to, to be able to address that. 
most of the American left, which you've just described, they use the word capitalism, but they mean inequality, they mean racism, they mean sexism. Um, and some of them will use words like socialism, but there really isn't very much of a political economic analysis. It just seems as if the rich are taking more and more, which is true. But uh, the fact that American society has been in structural crisis since the early 1970s, they don't have any way of dealing with that. Even Bernie Sanders, who's you know, a great guy. But Bernie Sanders, everything is bad trade policy. And you and I were speaking about this a little, that uh, American manufacturing is as large a proportion of gross domestic product as it ever was. It has not declined at all. What has declined are American manufacturing jobs. And there's a difference between them. And the real difference is automation. It's not China and it's not Mexico. It's automation. And there are very few political groups, including on the left, who are really trying to deal with that. So you would say the reaction of Bernie Sanders to the problems of uh, American capitalism is a uh, nationalistic reaction because trade and, and, and international trade is seen as the main culprit? I mean, there is left-wing nationalism, there is right-wing nationalism, yes. um, that's part of reality. Ultimately, I agree with you. I think that focusing on trade ultimately gets to a nationalist position where you defend the domestic working class. But if that is going to be your position, the right is much better at that. The right are much better nationalists. Uh, I think it's a strong mistake, and it indicates, I think, a, a, a weakness in working class movements. That in the course of the 20th century, because of the welfare state, etc., they became de facto nationalists. And what had been a dream before World War I of internationalism, people maybe paid lip service to it, but I think basically in terms of policies, that dissipated. Well, we are in the, in the depth of, uh, of the <clears throat> political discussion as in, in Europe too, if we look at the debates about CETA and TTIP and the international trade agreements that are considered anathema by, by, by the left in, in, in Europe. That's an interesting point. But let's maybe come back in, in the discussions uh, part of this <clears throat> session. Uh, let me ask you about your understanding uh, of Marx. First question, do you consider yourself a Marxist? No. I think Marx is probably the greatest theorist of the modern period. Uh, I think that his, Das Kapital is a work of really considerable genius. Uh, but most of what we call Marxism is really the writings of his very good friend Friedrich Engels, who I don't think really understood what Marx was about. Even though he supported Marx and he was really a good guy. Well, uh, you understood uh, apparently what Marx was about, so please tell us. No, it's not that I understand. It's more that I think I'm reading Marx from a different historical yeah. perspective. Yeah. Um, Engels' reading of Marx made a lot of sense when really the political issue was the growth and strength of the industrial working class. And it's a theory that really glorifies labor and glorifies the industrial working class. And the way I read Marx, and I think textually I can show this, but that's neither here nor there, Marx didn't write a critique of society from the standpoint of labor. 
he wrote a critique of labor. And he wrote a critique of the centrality of labor to modern capitalist life. And his idea of emancipation was the abolition of proletarian labor, not its realization, not its glorification. And this, Marx, I think, has something to say to us. Whereas the other Marx that I'm referring to as Engels, I think has less and less to say to us. The industrial working class is in decline. Marxists used to be able to talk about the terrible political ramifications of a declining class, and people don't want to see that if it was the petit bourgeois, bourgeoisie who declined at the beginning of the 20th century, it's the industrial working class now. So we need a new perspective. I mean, that is uh, for, I think, m most of us who had uh, maybe have been Marxist or at least read a lot of Marx, that is something surprising. You, uh, 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 your approach is a, m a Marxism without proletariat, without working class, as the historical uh, force to overcome exploitation, to overcome uh, uh, capitalism. Uh, so, no. Is that right? Right. Yeah. But the working class in Marx's analysis in Das Kapital, not in the Communist Manifesto, which is what everybody read, the working class is the essential class of Kapital. You can have Kapital without the bourgeoisie. You cannot have Kapital without a proletariat. So I know this is kind of like turning Marx, I think, on his feet, but others may think I'm turning him on his head. But it's the proletariat and the existence of the proletariat and the existence of capital are one. So uh, how does that make Marx, uh, uh, Marx's approach uh, important for today? Uh, in a situation where the proletariat is, uh, is, is a declining in numbers, declining force, in importance in, in, in society, declining force. So how does Marx help us to understand uh, the age of Trump, to come back to the title? Your um, reading of Marx. I think it helps us understand that's its strength. I think it doesn't provide us with very good guidelines for what to do. That's its weakness. The strength is that certainly, and I think this was veiled much more in Europe, but in the United States, the greatest period of prosperity is between 1945 and 1973. It's not only prosperity, it's also by far the greatest increases in productivity. Unusual because capitalism had much lower levels of productivity before the war. And much lower after 1973. You have this middle period that people took to be typical of capitalism. Capitalism now had solved all of the problems. Welfare state capitalism. It ended. There are a lot of theories why it ended, but you have to have a theory that can explain structurally what happened. And it's happened everywhere in the world. And one of the first signs of it in the United States was that starting in 1967, people who entered the workforce made less than those who came a year before them. Just a little bit less. Whereas between 1948 and 1970, 1967, every year, people who entered the workforce made more than their predecessors. Starting in 1973, that ended. American real wages have not risen since 1973. 
Well, probably there, there would be two arguments here. One is, okay, because of the weak trade unions, yeah, and if there would be a stronger trade union movement, that would not have happened. Or the uh, Trumpista answer would be, it's because of China, because of globalization. Yeah, and we've got to find a different one. And I think that uh, basically, I think that we're globally faced with what I regard as being a dual crisis, the environment and the crisis of work. And I think, and I, I can't go into detail here, if you read carefully Marx's analysis of relative surplus value and accumulation, it grounds, first of all, runaway growth and at the same time, declining levels of surplus value, and that they're related. And declining levels of surplus value are related to a growing superfluity of labor. People become more and more superfluous. And I don't think the left has an answer to that. The right does. It's a stupid answer. It's a dangerous answer. But they have an answer. It's the fault of immigrants or women or in the United States also blacks or China or Mexico and that we're going to draw back into a fortress. Fortress America, fortress Germany, whatever fortress. Fortress Britain. Fortress Austria. Yeah, we have a very strong party that wants a fortress Austria. Fortress, Maybe with Hungary, but... Uh, fortress together. Austria, <laughs> though I don't think that they really believe in Austria, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, and the right has... It's a little like anti-Semitism. You can explain abstract developments in terms of a concrete person or groups of people who are responsible for this. It's like Orban with Soros. Soros is, I mean, which is just anti-Semitism given a name. Soros is responsible for everything. The left doesn't have an answer to it, and to talk about inequality the way Occupy does is right, but it's only the surface. It doesn't deal with this kind of structural change that I've talked about, which has characterized America for the last half century and has left these burnt out places, the levels of opioid addiction in America is appalling. And it's mainly spread among people who once were working class. They're now the opioid class, and no one is addressing this. And the left talks about environment, but never about the relationship of environment and work. So in a sense, they leave all of these people out of the discourse. So then these people worry about work and they don't care about the environment. Well, what could the discourse be? If I understood, I stand, do understand you correctly, this is a change, an economic change that is independent uh, from what kind of uh, policy is happening, what kind, uh, kind of government we have. It's just because of uh, technological change that you have uh, great industrial graveyards in the US, industrial graveyards, I don't know, in Charleroi, in Belgium or, or in the UK. So basically what you're saying is you can't do anything about it. The future is with Google and, and, and the Facebooks and, and so on. Is that... What your point is? Uh, unfortunately, the future could be them, which would be a disaster. I think the problem, as I see it, is that for earlier generations of, let's say, Marxists, but more generally, this included social democrats as well, the idea of what the future should look like was fairly clear. There should be full employment, People should get living wages. You have a society based on the just distribution of labor. And it should be rationally organized. You could argue, should it be more democratically organized, less democratically organized, but it should be rationally organized. But 
the idea was a workerist society. We no longer have an imaginary of what a post-work society would look like, even forgetting about, which of course is important, how would we get there? But we don't even have that imaginary. I see my work as a little contribution to getting people to start thinking about the change that we're undergoing is as significant as the destruction of peasants and the rise of the waged labor was, you know, tremendous change in human history. I mean, what, what you're saying is striking uh, as, as, as a description of, of, of reality in the industrial world. It's different in China, it's different in Asia. Um, I mean, in China you have a working class that's still growing and uh, capitalism is still uh, developing and, and, and the wages are uh, growing and, and you have a, a optimism in, the, in, in society, maybe comparable to the uh, optimism you describe in the 60s in, in the US or in the 50s in, in the US among the working class. So is this a, uh, a situation that will wither away this, uh, the same way that, that uh, industrialization uh, got at a certain point where it could not go beyond that point anymore, or is it something different? I think so. Uh, we might disagree on the numbers. My understanding is the Chinese working class, which expanded enormously, stopped growing in 2007. 2006, 2007, 2008, and that that has had a ripple effect. And that then recently the Chinese stopped building 20 cities a year. And as soon as they stopped building 20 cities a year, Brazil, which became a primary commodities producer for the Chinese, Brazil hits the skids because all of the social welfare in Brazil was based on it being a rentier state. And it isn't anymore. Uh, the Chinese aren't buying Brazilian iron ore. They're not planting as much soy. They're not doing nearly as much in Brazil as they had. So I see this as a ripple effect. I don't think China is going to follow the United States very quickly. But I think this is a secular tendency. It's a long-range tendency. Well, uh, let, let's pursue your, your, your way of thinking. So we are, live in a world where the working class is shrinking. That's what you're saying. To which extent can it shrink? And what kind of consequences does that have for society, for the welfare state? As you mentioned, the welfare state is based, of course, on the contribution by existence of a, of a working class, organized working class. Uh, do you see the welfare state uh, shrinking because of objective reasons, the way the working class is shrinking? Unless we find a different form of welfare. Certainly in America, as you very well know, in America and Britain, it's hard to talk about the wealth. Well, the, Brit the Brits still have the national health. Uh, but it's hard to talk about the, a, a welfare state. Uh, the problem is you have a working class, and then you have a huge number of superfluous people. You have people in the jails. You have unemployed. You have opioid addicts. You have a growing number of people certainly in the United States, who are like the old Roman proletariat. They don't work. There is no work for them. Uh, and unless we can think of a different kind of social organization, for me it's a challenge. I don't feel that I'm anywhere near an answer to that. But uh, unless we can begin to start thinking about how to address this challenge, instead of just putting up defensive walls. I think we're lost. That, that is the... the uh, Thank you. What are the political <laughs> consequences? Let's pursue that, that way, way of reasoning. I mean, the organized working class in uh, Europe was the basis of uh, democracy, of democratic rights. In the US, uh, 
Um, you, you had also uh, a democracy built, strengthened on the basis of, of, of the existence of, of the working class. If the working class disappears, shrinks, withers away, uh, do you see a new area of authoritarian demagogues uh, be building their, their political power on, on the basis of giveaways from, uh, from, from the government? You, you mentioned uh, I mean, the way a Roman consul maybe uh, has done that. Is that the age I of authoritarianism? I think we're certainly in danger of that. And I think the swings to the right, Trump, Brexit, the strength of Le Pen, the IFD, the FPÖ, I think you know, Orban, uh, the Law and Justice Party, whatever they call themselves in Poland, I think we've, we've reached an age which is as potentially authoritarian as the interwar period that most of us thought had been left far behind. I think it's a very dangerous time, and uh, the problem is there is no compelling imaginary of what could be a different future. And I see that as a dilemma, because the demagogues, as I said before, have it much easier. Well, uh, Marx was sort of a historical optimist. You don't seem to share that part of Marxism, do you? Um, you know, my analogy is, if you want to understand the significance of a great work of art, you don't necessarily interview the artist. Um, I think what Marx developed through years of work in Das Kapital went beyond his political horizon. But if I were writing a biography of Marx, I think I would try to talk about this tension between Marx the analyst and Marx the revolutionary. But um, that's not what I'm doing, but... Uh, let's, before we go, uh, go to questions from the floor, let me um, um, uh, focus on, on the other issue of, of your research, anti-Semitism. Uh, which obviously was 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 a very uh, big part of, of 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 your approach of of your research and, and a central element of uh, 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 part of the catastrophes of the 21st century. Isn't anti-Semitism withering away in a certain way? I mean, there is the the feeling, okay, it's 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 anti-foreign of feeling. Uh, Islamophobia is the dominant uh, trend of of of, of racism, and anti-Semitism as a political force is not really in Europe. It, it may be it may be in the, in the background. You mentioned Orban. But uh, you can't compare it with, with an anti-Semitism 100 years ago in, in Vienna or in any, any other part uh, of Europe. How do you see the change of, of, of place of anti-Semitism in today's political life? Unfortunately, uh, my short answer is uh, Warta Ab. Uh, I don't see anti-Semitism and Islamophobia as occupying the same ecological niche any more than in America, anti-Semitism and racism. Not that one is worse than the other, they're different. They're fundamentally different. Anti-Semitism tries to explain the world. It's not just xenophobia, it's not just hatred of Jews, it's hatred of people who are in charge and they're invisible. It's hatred of a conspiracy it's an attempt to understand the abstract imperatives of capital in terms of somebody pulling the strings. In America, it's grown enormously in the last few years. There are more anti-Semitic incidents in the United States than there are anti-Islamic incidents. And that's saying something. Uh, for me, these are two different tracks. Not that one is instead of the other. I don't, 
and it's certainly possible to be violently anti-Semitic and violently Islamophobic at the same time. Uh, but I think that anti-Semitism, certainly in France, certainly in England, where sometimes it takes the form of anti-Zionism, and there are different forms, as we know, there are different forms of anti-Zionism. Netanyahu likes to say that all forms of anti-Zionism are anti-Semitic. He's wrong. But the opposite isn't true, that no forms of anti-Zionism are anti-Semitic. I mean, in the discussion we had before, you, you mentioned that even in Trump, there are coded messages that, yes. uh, that, there are, uh, that, that have anti-Semitic connotations. Can you explain? What kind, uh, where do you see that? Well, during the Trump campaign and afterwards, in social media, there are an incredible number of anti-Semitic images that were floating. You never used to have them that strongly in the United States. And any journalist who wrote negatively about Trump and was Jewish received an incredible amount of hate mail. And we're going to send you to the ovens, to the gas chambers. There was a huge amount of that that the respectable press tended not to report as much. Uh, and this emerged so strongly with Trump. It's just like in Britain, my understanding is that uh, since the Brexit vote, there is a spike in the number of anti-foreign violence. It's as if they've suddenly been given license to do this. The Trump campaign gave license to all of the neo-Nazis who've been working in the background. People don't think of neo-Nazis in the United States. This is a mistake, unfortunately. Uh, and then right-wing Jews say, oh, Trump can't be anti-Semitic because of his son-in-law and daughter, but that's foolish. And it also is not a matter of his own personal attitudes. It's a matter of what kind of forces he's appealing to. Well, uh, we are living in dangerous times. That's, uh, I, I guess, think that's fair. I, I, I guess that uh, sums up a little bit how your, your, your sharp analysis uh, goes. Uh, and I would just open up to the floor uh, for a session of, 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 of questions and contributions. Please be so nice, present yourself, uh, tell us who you are. You'll, there is going to be a mic. Yes, it's coming from over there. And you can ask uh, your questions or contrib contributions in German as well as in English, of course. I'll stick to, um, I'll sp stick to English. Um, my name is Paul Werner, and I represent Bernie Sanders' group, Our Revolution, here in Austria. Uh, I guess I should apologize to you, Dr. Postone, and my own doctorate is from one of those lowly universities that don't count. It's a public university. Let, let me finish, okay? Uh, it's from the uh, City University of New York, uh, which is a public university and has uh, probably as many uh, Nobel Prize winners as any university in America. Uh, more to the point, it's also the university that houses and has housed for quite a while some of the best thinkers about c capitalism we have in America, including a number who would openly call themselves Marxists. People like Wolf, people like Harvey, people like, um, let's say, uh, Stanley Aronowitz even, who, by the way, like myself, was a member of the United Auto Workers. So um, I think that your take on uh, what is going on in the American intellectual milieus, um, maybe we should go back to um, Marx's um, comment that it's time to school the educators a bit. Uh, I might add also in passing that in terms of proposing ideas, me and my buddies have been proposing ideas since we were being anarchists in downtown New York in the uh, 1970s. Uh, so to pretend there are no solutions to say that um, 
because you don't see it happening, it doesn't exist. It reminds me of a good joke that Marx and Engels once uh, shared. Um, there ain't no such thing as materialist empiricism. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Well, let's, let's get, get some questions, contributions together, and then uh, Professor Postone uh, will respond. Any other? Uh, yes, the lady here. Do you not think you're dignifying Trump too much by saying that this is the age of Trump? It's like saying we've had the age of Hitler, we've had the age of something. We hope that Trump is a fairly temporary thing. What you accentuated at the end of your talk was that a lot of Trump came about by the social media. And if you were saying that Marx and the social media and the ignorance expressed in that is more true of that. But to actually call it our age, the age of Trump, degrades us all, I think. I think Professor Postone is not responsible for I'm the not title. Responsible for I that title. <laughs> that, is, that was a catchword from the organizers in order to get you all here in here. <laughs> Any other? Yes, gentlemen here. Thank you very much for a very, very uh, inspiring talk. Uh, personally, I cannot wait for your book uh, to come out. But I would like uh, to ask your opinion about two other recent books. The first one is, of course, uh, Piketty's Capital in the 21st Century. And the second one is the work by the German economist Streeck, What Will Come After Capitalism. I'm assuming you also know that book. Okay, first of all, uh, with all due apologies, I wasn't promoting the idea of a hierarchy. I was saying de facto it exists, A. B, I'm a great admirer of the city university system. I am. And I'm a great admirer of Stanley Aronowitz and David Harvey, and I know them and we're in discussions. However, if you accuse me of blinders, one thing I've always found about my New York friends is that they regard New York as being more than New York. They regard New York as being the United States. And it's... <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, in terms of Piketty, uh, Shaik, I, I only glanced at. Piketty, I kind of worked through. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the, the French political economist, Thomas Piketty, together with people like Saez in Berkeley, they worked out the levels of inequality using a great deal of empirical research. The ways in which inequality was extremely high at the beginning of the 20th century, declined, reached its low point in the middle decades of the 20th century, and then began rising again. It's like a U-shaped curve. And I think it's very good that they indicated that, but Piketty himself thinks the entire issue is tax policy. First of all, the the graph that he, cho that, he, that he and the others show is transnational. That's number one. Number two, the other factors that I mentioned, the question of GDP per capita growth, the question of wage, they all fit roughly in that same pattern. What Piketty doesn't do, as far as I'm concerned, and a lot of people who focus only on inequality, they don't try to understand what drives the pattern. It's not only that a bunch of Chicago co economists took over, and then you had Reagan and, and Thatcher. 
that's only part of the answer. There were structural problems that happened. And I don't think someone like Piketty can deal or does deal with those kinds of structural issues. And one of the things that I think an anal uh, a, a Marxian, if not Marxist analysis, is strong on is structural analysis. Even if we may disagree on what the nature of the structure is and exactly what happened in the early 70s, there's a lot of debate and disagreement. But most people who work within a Marxist or Marxian paradigm think that the great success of the welfare state came to a grinding halt, and not only because of, you know, a few policymakers. Let, uh, let us see if there are some more questions here. here. Yes, there are the lady here. Professor yeah. Collect some more questions, yes, please. It was a pleasure to hear Marx's analysis from an economist, economics perspective. My question is about this or uh, request, whether you can help us um, develop this imaginary uh, about the post-work society. I mean, uh, among people working in robotics, artificial intelligence, and even um, uh, mainstream uh, economies are now accepting that universal income is what has to happen, and maybe all workers in the future will be doing coding. So can you bring us some more um, uh, ideas? This is a little bit short. Thank you. Okay, let's go. Uh, returning to Marx, um, he claimed that the owners of the means of production have the power to acquire the surplus value. Now we are in the position that uh, they, they still are in the same position and there, there are fewer and fewer workers that can claim a share of it. So uh, uh, this is, I fully agree, this, the, the big driver of inequality is the technological revolution and the changes in the, the way we produce. Now, doesn't this but this is raise a very dangerous question, the property of the means of production. To, uh, okay, thank you. Okay, one, one, one last question over there, if we can, and then Professor Boston. Um, hi, Professor Poston. Thanks so much for your talk. Um, I have two questions that are interrelated. Um, I thought it was very interesting when you likened the current moment to the historical moment when the peasantry was transformed into a workforce or industrial workforce. Um, but according to Marx, that moment had an emancipatory aspect to it. There was some potential. And I would be interested in hearing whether you think that the current transformation also harbors some sort of emancipatory potential if there's a way, in other words, in which it points beyond itself. Um, and my second question is related to that. Um, you also, you mentioned, I think, uh, several times that we need to find a new way to organize society. Um, I'm not gonna ask you how, I, I know that would be maybe a little too much for now, but I would be interested in who do you mean by we? Um, meaning, who is the actor? Is there a need for a new political movement? Um, do you see uh, a certain potential in a different, uh, in a specific class or in an alliance of classes? Do you think the left can be, uh, well, I mean, I don't wanna say <laughs> salvage, but you know, who is the carrier of that? And where do you think it should start? All very easy questions, Professor <laughs> Right, so where do I start? Um, I think it's perfectly legitimate to talk about the fact that there are people who are thinking about uh, guaranteed income, for example, as a way of trying to deal with the crisis of work. Um, and I think that that could be a very important building block. Nevertheless, there's a question of what should people be doing? They're not all going to code. What should people be doing? Is it just that everybody gets an income and they stay at home and they 
snort methamphetamines. Uh, so there has to be, it seems to be, as part of the imaginary, uh, the idea that it's important for people to be engaged in activity which has meaning for them. That that is very important, that, that putting a floor under people is, is necessary, is absolutely necessary, but maybe that's not a sufficient answer. Uh, so I was just trying to push that a little further, not that I am now a one-person think tank and I can come up, I think these are like very good issues. Uh, of course, private property is important, but it's not the only thing. And what I've tried to work out is that Marx, and I can't go into detail here, Marx's analysis of value, of Wert, is not an analysis of Reichtum. These are two different categories. And value has a temporal uh, dimension a dimension of time that exerts compulsion on whoever owns the means of production as long as value is the form of wealth. So yes, on a more surface level, it's private ownership of the means of production. But you could have a state owning all of the means of production still being subjected to the compulsions of value. So I am focusing much more on value theory, but I can't go into all of this now. This would be, I think, too much. Um, I'm not sure that Marx thought that the transformation of peasantry into the working class was necessarily emancipatory. I think it's both. I think one of his strengths as a theorist is to see the double-sidedness of almost every development as being both positive and negative at one and the same time. So that capitalism really unleashes human productivity in ways that were unknown historically beforehand and does so in a form that oppresses individuals and destroys the environment. But it's both. It's both at one and the same time. And it seems to me that it's this double-sidedness of the critique which is in part its strength because most or many social analysts either get enamored with the growth and the horizon is limitless, or they only see the degree to which capitalism has involved also the oppression and crushing of people. Uh, and it's very difficult to keep both in one's mind at the same time. The advantage of traditional, what I call traditional Marxism, was that the bearer of a revolutionary movement was already predefined. Here, it's not. This is maybe a weakness, but rather than just saying, well, it's now going to be X, no, that will have to coalesce. So the we, who is the we? We, that's don't, a good, we don't know who is the we. No, I think that's a very good point. The we has to be coalesced. And the task of theory, among other things, is negative, is to say, no, that's the wrong path. Theory is better at saying what's wrong than saying what's right. But it's an important task. Yeah, thank you very much. Are there any urgent contributions, questions, uh, points that we missed? Because I think we are at the end of our uh, prepared time. Uh, and I think this was a 
enlightening uh, approach, uh, a very broad discussion. Thank you very much for your uh, contribution. Thank you very much for sharpening our mind. We might not leave this session as pure optimists, but um, probably we di didn't get here being uh, pure, optimists. pure optimists. But certainly you helped us sh shape our mind and uh, that is something uh, that always leads to uh, uh, solutions and that makes it possible to uh, get out of difficult situations. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you for listening. Thank you.